Earth is home to the most stunning beaches in the solar system. But 3.6 billion years ago, Mars might have given us a run for our money. Imagine standing on a rust red shore at dusk, gentle tides lapping around your ankles. The dark water stretches out to the horizon. For a second, it reminds you of your home planet until you look up and spot not one, but two moons in the twilight sky, Phobos and Deimos. But the idea that Mars has oceans isn't new. It's been a popular theory for decades. However, so far, most of our findings have come from indirect observations of Mars. Over the years, this has given rise to multiple interpretations of the data, leading some scientists to reject the Mars ocean theory entirely. Earlier this year, researchers unveiled a groundbreaking discovery a few years in the making. It didn't come from NASA or ESA, but from the China National Space Administration's Zurong rover. What it found out could silence these skeptics forever, fundamentally changing our understanding of Martian evolution and guiding us to the best place to hunt for signs of alien life. I'm Alex McColgan and you're watching Astrum. Join me today as we dive into China's landmark mission to Mars, the remarkable data its rover uncovered, and what this means for the search for life beyond Earth. Water is the most precious material in the world. It covers 70% of our planet and makes up 60% of our bodies. It courses through rivers, fills seas, lakes and ponds, and is necessary for all life as we know it. Yet for a molecule so abundant on Earth, it's surprisingly scarce in our solar system. When it comes to Mars, we know it had water as far back as 4.45 billion years ago, thanks to evidence from crystals hidden within a Martian meteorite that could have only formed in the presence of hot, water-rich fluids. Martian dust has also been found to contain ferrihydrite, a mineral that only forms in the presence of water. We've also found evidence for ancient rivers and polar ice covering an area similar to the US. Some resilient forms of Martian life could be preserved deep within these ice caps, but a shoreline could have supported an abundance of life, possibly entire diverse ecosystems and they might have left behind biosignatures, like scavenger hunt clues we can use to paint a picture of Mars's ancient coastal habitats. Shore environments offer key advantages to budding life. They concentrate organic molecules through evaporation, promote the formation of complex molecules like RNA and protein, and provide mineral-rich surfaces and energy sources like UV radiation, heat, and chemical gradients all of which can drive the chemistry needed for life to arise. In contrast, rivers are too dynamic and dilute to support the delicate chemical conditions needed for life to arise. They constantly flush materials downstream, making it difficult for molecules to accumulate and react the way they need to to form life. So if researchers could find evidence of a standing body of water on Mars, like a lake or an ocean, they'd be in a much better spot to search for remnants of microbial life. Now, the Chinese Tianwen-1 mission might have just captured the most compelling evidence yet for ancient oceans on Mars. It's the first on-the-ground data ever collected of a suspected ocean zone, and it makes a strong case that our shoreline theory is on the right track. On the 23rd of July 2020, the Tianwen-1 spacecraft began its 202-day journey to Mars. Aboard, it carried an orbiter, lander, and the Tsurong rover. The aim of the mission was to investigate Mars's geology, climate, and habitability through three key activities. By studying the surface and subsurface of the Utopia Planitia, a region scientists think could be an ancient ocean basin based on mapping from satellite data, by performing climate and weather monitoring, including magnetic field variations and dust activities effect on solar panels and climate. 
and by searching for signs of water and habitability, investigating whether the region harbored conditions suitable for life in the past. On the 10th of February 2021, Tianwen-1 entered into orbit around Mars. Controllers spent three months testing the probe systems, shifting its orbital path from equatorial to polar and preparing it for its main science mission. Finally, on the 14th of May, the lander touched down on the Red Planet, and a week later, the Tsurong rover was successfully deployed, making China only the second nation in history to successfully deploy a rover on Mars, behind the USA. For China, this mission represented more than just scientific discovery. It showcased their spaceflight capabilities and autonomy, and demonstrated they can launch and operate missions without relying on foreign navigation or communication systems. The Tianwen mission, meaning questions to heaven, laid the foundation for future Chinese missions like a Mars sample return and a possible crewed mission to Mars by 2033. The 240 kilogram rover was deployed in a region of Mars known as Utopia Planitia, the largest known impact basin in the whole solar system. It's the same region where the NASA Viking missions landed almost 50 years ago, but recently interest in this area was revived due to a 2016 NASA discovery. Turns out it is home to a massive amount of underground ice, about as much water as you'd find in Lake Superior, about 12,100 kilometers cubed, or 1 times 10 to the power 16 liters. So, to study this promising region, the Tsurong rover came equipped with 13 different scientific payloads, which can be thought of as four categories. Radars, to detect subsurface structures up to 100 meters underground, including the ground-penetrating ROPA radar. Spectrometers, to analyze soil and rock compositions, including a laser-induced breakdown and infrared spectrometer. Optical cameras that will image the planet from both the orbiter and the rover, as well as provide topography and navigation capabilities, and monitors for atmosphere and space environments that will detect the magnetic field, space radiation, and the climate of Mars, including a surface magnetometer and the Mars Climate Station, designed to monitor local temperature, wind, pressure, and even record sound. The rover also carried a deployable wireless selfie camera that produced some of the mission's most iconic images, like these. Tsurong selfies safely traveled hundreds of millions of kilometers through open space as a radio transmission. When they arrived on Earth, scientists knew how to decode the radio signals into the colorful image we see before us. Yet every day, millions of people send their own selfies across the internet without that extra layer of protection. Just like Tsurong Signals needed the right decoding to reveal its image, you can encrypt your personal data and online activity so it can't be decoded if it falls into the wrong hands. That's exactly how today's sponsor, NordVPN, protects your safety and privacy online. It hides your connection so hackers, internet providers, or someone snooping on public Wi-Fi can't see what you're doing. And by keeping you anonymous, Nord lowers your risk of online scams like phishing, robocalls, and even fraud. Best of all, it's fast. With thousands of servers in over 100 countries, you stay connected and up to speed from anywhere in the world. Right now, you can get four extra months free with their two-year plan. Just scan this QR code or head to nordvpn.com forward slash ashtrim to get started. There's even a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you've got nothing to lose. Thanks NordVPN for sponsoring this channel. Let's get back to our little rover. So loaded up with all these scientific payloads, what exactly did Zurong discover about the Martian coastline that past missions had missed? To fully understand this, we need a quick geography lesson. On Earth, sediment particles are transported by wind, water, and ice, carried through rivers, or moved downhill by glaciers. The sediment is eventually deposited in low energy environments like river deltas, lake and ocean floors, floodplains, and the base of hills or mountains. 
but it can also happen along coastlines, more specifically along the part of the beach known as the foreshore. This is a dynamic part of the shoreline, between the high tide and low tide lines. Here sediment can be added or removed depending on things like wind, tides, weather events, and the type and size of sediment particles. On Earth, the foreshore zone tends to slope gently towards the sea. The gradient of the slope depends on the type of sediment. For example, beaches made of smaller, finer particles result in low gradient beaches, while beaches with cobbles may be stacked as steep as 20 degrees. These sloping layers record the long-term balance between sediment supply, wave energy, and water level, and can be preserved in the geological record for millions of years. Back on Mars, the Tsurong rover was hard at work studying the planet's subsurface topography. It did this by sending radio waves into the ground using its Roper radar. When the radio wave hits a boundary between two different materials, for example when the composition shifts from fine-grained sediment to coarser sand, the signal bounces back. This creates a reflector in the radar image. What grabbed the Tsurong's team's attention was not just that signals were bouncing back, but the angle they were bouncing back at. All 76 of the geological reflectors they encountered sloped in the same direction at an angle between 6 and 20 degrees. Putting the pieces together, the team realized that 10 to 35 meters below the planet's surface lies a 1.3 kilometer stretch of terrain sloping towards the lowlands. It seemed like more than coincidence. Could this be proof of what they were looking for? The indisputable evidence for an ancient shoreline on Mars. The team hurried to compare this Martian picture to the buried beaches found on Earth and found the Bay of Bengal to be such a strikingly similar Earth analog, they even featured this finding in their paper. One of the co-authors of the original research paper that published the findings said, it's a simple structure, but it tells you there had to be waves, there had to be a nearby river supplying sediment, and all these things had to be active for some extended period of time. We also know that the Sun and Mars's bigger moon, Phobos, do affect the planet's surface gravity, which could have caused tides on the ancient ocean. The team briefly considered, but ultimately ruled out other possible explanations for the sloping structures. They argued both sand dunes and lava flows would lead to slopes pointing in multiple directions, yet in the Tsurong data, all the reflectors point the same way. They concluded that these slopes were more consistent with a coastal foreshore environment, strengthening the case that Mars once had dynamic shorelines that experienced tides, wind, and waves, just like Earth does today. For decades, scientists have been locked in heated debate over the question of Mars's oceans. The evidence seemed frustratingly unclear. Prominent researchers dismissed shoreline evidence as artifacts or poor image resolution, and climate modelers struggled to explain how liquid water could exist on an early Mars with a fainter sun. You see, 3.5 billion years ago, our sun was about 25% dimmer than it is now, too faint to keep Mars above freezing. And yet, our climate models predict that at the time, Mars would have been covered in rivers, lakes, and even oceans. This leads to what is known as the faint young sun paradox. If the heat for liquid water didn't come from the sun, it must have come from Mars's atmosphere. This has led to three theories trying to solve the faint young sun paradox. The first says Mars was warm and wet. The idea is that Mars's atmosphere was loaded with greenhouse gases, mainly carbon dioxide and water vapor, which made it so dense it could trap enough heat to allow liquid water to persist for millions of years. This would explain the evidence pointing to rainfall, lakes, and oceans. But the problem is, according to our models, carbon dioxide and water vapor alone 
can't produce the warming needed for this scenario. Other gases like methane, ammonia, or hydrogen would be needed, but they are unstable and hard to maintain long term. The second possibility is that Mars was only warm and wet some of the time, mainly in response to major events like massive volcanic eruptions or asteroid impacts. These could release huge amounts of heat or greenhouse gases, creating long-lived warm spells where ice melted, rivers flowed, and erosion occurred. But we can't know for sure if the intensity and frequency of these spells would have been enough to carve all the valleys and fill the lakes we see evidence for today. And finally, some think Mars spent most of its history as a frozen ball. Landscapes were dominated by snow and ice, but under certain conditions like changes in Mars' orbit or sudden heating events, the ice melted. This explains why Mars shows signs of both glacier activity and flowing water. But what could have melted all that ice often enough for the erosion we see to occur? None of these three scenarios perfectly explain Mars's past climate. Frustratingly, despite the strong evidence for shorelines, we still don't know how to reframe our models of Mars's early climate to allow for water to persist there. Solving the faint young sun paradox may be the key to understanding whether Mars was ever truly habitable. So, it's too soon to get carried away imagining some billionaire digging up Martian beaches and turning them into resorts. The truth is, we still need more data to put the full puzzle together. NASA was planning to launch a sample return mission sometime in 2027 or 2028, with a return scheduled for the early 2030s. This would give us more clarity into the planet's complex ancient geology, and perhaps close the debate for good. But uncertainty around NASA's budget has pushed the sample return until 2040, with recent proposed cuts putting it at risk of being cancelled altogether. Even though Tsurong was only designed to last 93 Earth days, it persisted well beyond this timeline, collecting data for an impressive 358 days until it went dormant on the 20th of May 2022. With appropriate temperature and sunlight conditions, Tsurong was expected to wake up in December 2022, but never did, due to excess dust accumulation. As we look to the future, more questions remain to be answered. If Mars had stable oceans for millions of years, what happened to all that water? How did the planet transition from a potentially habitable world to the frozen desert we see today? Could a similar fate await Earth? And if life did emerge in these ancient coastal environments, could traces of it still exist buried beneath the surface? Only time and another exciting mission to our red neighbor will tell. Thanks for watching, and thanks to our crew of astronauts over at Patreon who help us make science knowledge freely available to everyone. Chasing the algorithm can be hit and miss sometimes, so your contributions help us keep making the content we love. And if you want to join the Patreon, there's never been a better time to get in on the party. Just sign up with the link in the description. When you join, you'll be able to watch the whole video ad-free, see your name in the credits, and submit questions to our team. Meanwhile, click the link to this playlist for more Astrum content. I'll see you next time.